Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Five Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. Covered on this week's episode, a cyber gang has claimed they have breached Microsoft systems and retrieved the credentials of 30 million customers. OpenAI and Microsoft have been hit with a proposed class action lawsuit. And a recent study from Stanford suggests 100% remote work hurts productivity. For this and more, keep listening to this episode of the podcast, which as always is brought to you by my fantastic sponsors. And that includes ControlUp, end-to-end digital experience management for the work from anywhere era. ControlUp, happy users, happy IT. And also brought to you by Networks Policy Pack, where you use Group Policy, Policy Pack Cloud, or MDM to remove local admin rights, manage lockdown applications, Java, browsers, and mitigate ransomware, plus more. And of course, also brought to you by Numescent, the inventors of the first and only cloud-native container management platform for Windows desktops. If you enjoy the show each week, you have these awesome sponsors to thank. And now for some news. The recurring story that I've covered on this podcast of rolling Outlook outages and denial of service attacks launched by a hacktivist group called Anonymous Sudan is now heating up once again with the group now claiming they breached Microsoft servers and stole credentials for 30 million customer accounts. At the time of this recording, Microsoft is denying those claims. The group Anonymous Sudan offered to sell their database to interested parties for $50,000 and urged interested buyers to engage in contact with their Telegram bot to arrange the purchase of the data. They even teased the cache of credentials by showing 100 account credential pairings. So at least it looks legitimate by having these accounts to show off. However, Microsoft are denying the claims that this is legitimate. So it is possible the group are just chancing their arms to make some quick cash. And in actuality, they may have credential pairings for Outlook customers from other past breaches and maybe passing them off as current. You know, they may have got credentials from other breaches that were not even Microsoft related and they're just showing those as though they got them recently from Microsoft servers. If you listen to this podcast regularly, you may remember when I covered the Outlook outages several weeks ago, this group was claiming they were behind the disruption, but Microsoft did not confirm the outages were caused by a denial of service attack for at least a couple of weeks. However, at least this time, Microsoft have quickly and emphatically denied the claims. They're not just saying, oh, well, there's been an issue and not confirming these claims this time. They are very quickly coming out, acknowledging the claims made by the group, but flatly denying them. So hopefully that is the case and this was not a legitimate breach. LeapyComputer.com has reported that when some of users of Windows 11 21H2 and 22H2 plus Windows Server 2022 devices click on the View Effective Access button under Properties and Advanced to check a shared file or folder's effective permissions, they may be seeing a message stating, quote, Computing Effective Access, end quote, but without displaying any query results. Additionally, the explorer.exe process would just keep using CPU resources even after closing out of the advanced security settings dialog, leading to file explorer sessions freezing. This issue and behavior started to occur for some after installing the May Windows update, so it's been going on for some time for at least some users. A workaround suggested is to simply just reboot the system or sign out with the affected user account. Microsoft did release an optional cumulative update for the latest Windows 11 22H2 version this month, and BleepyComputer.com reports other affected Windows versions should receive a patch this month, which is obviously July, if you're listening to this in the future. Uh, This was the July updates. Several users have been reporting an issue when launching Google Chrome, where it first launches the settings menu on Windows with the selection for default programs for file association purposes being presented. Personally, I run a nightly script which checks for Google Chrome updates on the Chrome site, actually via the Evergreen PowerShell module, which I've mentioned multiple times on this podcast. If you're not familiar with it, check it out. 
great work by Aaron Parker on that. Uh, but regardless, I have a script that checks every night to see if there's a new Chrome update and auto packages it and deploys it if there is a new version. Well, I was experiencing this behavior too for quite some time actually. It was more of an annoyance than a blocker, at least to me, but it appears with the recent minor revision that ends with .199, it was fixed. Well, that is, it was fixed for me at least. I no longer get that uh, menu popping up on launch. Interestingly, at least over the last couple months, I was seeing pretty much nightly updates for Chrome, at least for Chrome that is hosted on Google's uh, download site. That doesn't mean that if you had Chrome installed that it was uh, self-updating every night, but what was being staged and offered for download seemed to be getting updated to a new minor rev pretty much every night for several weeks. But now it seems like there hasn't been an update in over a week and it's remained static on .199. And that's not entirely surprising because I believe back in 2021, Google moved their update cadence to have a major version released every four weeks instead of every six weeks and minor updates every one to two weeks. So it looks like they're maybe falling into their more regular update cadence now after a hectic few weeks. BleepyComputer.com has recently reported that Microsoft's Edge Browser's Edge Secure Network feature, which is essentially an embedded VPN feature, is increasing the amount of data allowed for users from one gig up to five gigs. This can be handy to turn on when you have no choice but to go on a public network or if you have something particularly sensitive you wish to safeguard from network eavesdroppers. But having said that, if you do find yourself traveling quite a bit and in need to go on public networks, I would strongly suggest just paying for a VPN product subscription as a 5 gig limit could be pretty restrictive for someone who relies on a VPN regularly. But still, nice to have that option. And I know, I think, uh, doesn't Apple have a similar feature embedded within their OS now or within the Safari browser? So it makes sense to have a competing feature within Edge. And it's just a nice to have. Ars Technica have reported last week that Red Hat announced that CentOS Stream will be the sole repository for public RHEL related source code releases with RHEL's core code otherwise restricted to a customer portal. This move, which effectively moves open source code behind a paywall, has not gone down well with the community, with claims that Red Hat's moves violate the spirit and purpose of open source. RHEL has been used to create rebuild flavors of the OS by others, including major enterprises who offer their own Linux distros. Just one example of a developer outraged by this is Jeff Gerling, who says he's dropping RHEL support from his Ansible and other software projects, saying that Red Hat's moves are intended to destroy Rocky, Alma, and other RHEL derivatives, and that after the knife in the back of abandoning full CentOS Linux, the recent moves took that knife and twisted it hard. So I believe it was last year that they announced abandonment of the CentOS Linux. So this certainly does seem like a, a one-two punch by Red Hat. For their part, Red Hat's Mike McGrath unfortunately will not have helped quell the outrage by stating, quote, Ultimately, we do not find value in a RHEL rebuild and we are not under any obligation to make things easier for rebuilders. This is our call to make. Simply rebuilding code without adding value or changing it in any way represents a real threat to open source companies everywhere. This is a real threat to open source and one that has the potential to revert open source back into a hobbyist and hackers only activity. End quote. Now, going through comments from developers, it is not just those branching off their own distros who are crying foul and swearing off Red Hat entirely, so this appears to be a very dangerous balancing act for the company. Kind of like the Reddit API charges, I can understand where Red Hat is coming from with this, but similarly to Reddit, this is something that may blow up in their face. 
BPcomputer.com reported that a Microsoft Teams security flaw recently exposed by UK security company JumpSec, which can allow external actors to send malicious content to an organization's team users by tricking teams into treating an external user as an internal one just by changing the ID in the post request of a message, now has an active exploit. The exploit was created by a member of the U.S. Navy's red team, and it is called Teams Fisher. It sounds like it is very easy to use from the description in this article. It allows you to simply send an attachment, a message, and a list of target Teams users. It will upload the attachment to the sender SharePoint and then iterate through the list of targets. The tool also first verifies the user list to ensure they are genuine users and has a bunch of optional parameters such as sending malicious content as a secure link to trick people into thinking that, you know, this is definitely safe. It's not something nefarious when it actually is. Microsoft did not have this bug as a priority to fix, and the suggestion from security experts at this time is to simply disable the feature that allows contact from external accounts. Windows Package Manager version 1.5.1572 has now been released, and this is the first major release of version 1.5. With it, it brings the ability to pin a package. There's a new switch for dash dash uninstall previous for performing upgrades. You can add a dash dash custom argument for passing additional installer arguments, an improved correlation for optimized search in rest source, and improved general correlation by downloading manifests. There's also several different bug fix and other enhancements, and I'll share a link to the release notes if you'd like to check out everything for yourself, which you'll find over at 5bytespodcast.com for this episode, which is episode 289. WindowsCentral.com has reported that OpenAI have temporarily pulled the plug on the recently launched Browse with Bing beta feature that was made available to ChatGPT Plus subscribers. Just shortly after incorporating the new feature last week into the chatbot, OpenAI discovered that there are instances where it malfunctions. For example, if a user specifically asks for a URL's full text, it might inadvertently fulfill this request according to OpenAI. And this is regardless of whether or not that text features in an article that is behind a paywall, as several Reddit users shared that they were able to bypass such paywalls using ChatGPT by prompting the tool to print the text on an article behind a paywall via the browser feature. It remains to be seen when or if the feature will be restored. In more bad news for OpenAI, the company has been hit with a proposed class action lawsuit alleging that the company stole and misappropriated vast swaths of people's data from the internet to train its AI tools. Well, yeah, (laughs) of course, Uh, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Uh, The nearly 160-page complaint filed in California alleges that this personal data, including essentially every piece of data exchanged on the internet it could take, was also seized by the company without notice, consent, or just compensation. Moreover, this data scraping occurred at an unprecedented scale, the suit claims. Both OpenAI and their major investor, Microsoft, have been named in the suit. Interestingly, I saw that there was a suggestion in the 160 pages that even the personal data of children has been scraped by the service. CNN reports the lawsuit seeks injunctive relief in the form of a temporary freeze on further commercial use of OpenAI's products. It also seeks payments of data dividends as financial compensation to people whose information was used to develop and train OpenAI's tools. So if this is successful, this would have very far reaching implications and would be very, very costly to potentially open AI and Microsoft. Something tells me though, with all the buzz about AI and this whole AI race between companies and companies based in different countries and regulators trying to find a way to compromise uh, just to keep AI companies in their countries ahead of the game ahead in the war or the race, I feel like this class action lawsuit may just go by the wayside. But 
Hey, I could be wrong. I guess we'll have to wait and see. A recent study by Stanford University has been published that looks into work from home. So it mostly centers around the US for the data, but there is some other insights and data shared from other countries too. Some of the interesting points that I found in the study was that over 60% of days were worked from home in May 2020, which was the largest work from home ever. But as the pandemic eased over the next three years, levels of remote work dropped and by summer 2023, they appeared to be converging towards about 25% of days. Ultimately, the pandemic increased the share of days worked from home from about 5% in 2019 to 25% in 2023, which is a five-fold increase, equivalent to about 35 years of pre-pandemic growth. There was a comparison with some other countries, like I said, that compares it to the US, and there's a suggestion that the US had a greater sustained uptake of work from home than some other countries, with a suggestion that the size of homes in the US may be larger than those in some of the other countries, making it easier for people to work from home. The report also suggests that about 1.7% more women work from home than men, People in their 30s and 40s had the highest preference for work from home. Some of the younger workers lean more towards work in the office with the suggestion that early in their careers, working from home could pose a barrier to progressing up the ladder and they enjoy the socializing aspect of working in the office, which I'm not really sure about that point, to be honest. Uh, but they also say that at that young age, they may be renting a shared accommodation or living at home which makes working from home more challenging for them, which, yeah, I buy that reason for sure. It reported that older employees in their 50s and 60s are less keen on working from home, which, again, to me is not a surprise. And then I would say or suggest that if you look at upper management and executive level, there's probably a lot of those people in their 50s and 60s who are kind of ruling the roost in a lot of companies. And the fact that they're in the demographic that's less keen on working from home, they're probably setting these policies uh, for reduced work from home, hybrid, and then possibly dropping the hammer and having no more work from home, regardless of what the other demographics preference would be. Or at least that's, at least that's certainly been the case for some companies, as I reported on previous episodes of the podcast. The research suggests productivity saw a decline for those working from home 100% and a slight increase for those working hybrid, though in my opinion this section is a little confusing as it suggests productivity decreased for managers who were remote, but significantly increased for the workers. So is it kind of as a whole that the productivity decreased when people were working 100% from home, but in actuality for the actual key workers rather than management, there's been a significant productivity boost? I don't know. I mean, other studies have suggested that people feel like their productivity did increase. Um, there are those who are suggesting that they feel like the technology being used to enable their work from home is hindering their productivity. So, I mean, both can be true, right? Perhaps advancements in the technology over the coming years will actually make people more productive than they currently are. I'm sure that would be the case. And now this episode, scripts, tricks, and tips. First up, Harm Veenstra had a really good blog post and an accompanying script within the blog post for searching Windows event logs using PowerShell. Uh, so this is something I've actually featured on numerous episodes, scripts, tricks, and tips, as uh, other people have solutions and scripts that they use for searching Windows event logs using PowerShell. And I actually personally created one uh, when I worked in a hospital setting uh, for the same thing. And I probably could have just saved some time by uh, leveraging a script from somebody who's much more capable of PowerShell like Harm. So this may save you some time. It could be a useful one to file away for the day that you do need to go trolling through Windows event logs to uh, troubleshoot an issue. Peter Vandevoud had a blog post on easily configuring the Intune management extension as managed installers for the Windows Defender application control feature. So obviously Intune is a very hot topic and 
the Windows Defender application control has a lot of advantages from the perspective of enhancing your security. So this may be of interest to you. And this last one's probably not one for IT people, though it could be shared with your less tech savvy people in your lives. MSPowerUser.com shared a quick how-to to get Teams notifications to appear on iPhones. It is basically just a case of going into the settings and enabling notifications for the app in the iPhone settings. And this could apply to other apps too. So like if someone's using Slack and the notifications never appear, uh, it may just be a case that notifications is not enabled within the settings of the iPhone. So it's one of those that, especially if you have people working remotely, they may call into the help desk and say they never get notifications on their device. Well, this may be why, because the app itself is probably not in control. It's a setting on the actual phone. Well, that's it for this week's episode of the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening.